What is love? That is the great question of Beauvoir's most famous essay in The Second Sex, entitled The Woman in Love. The word love has not at all the same meaning for both sexes, she writes, and this is a source of the grave misunderstandings that separate them. Byron rightly said that love is merely an occupation in the life of the man, while it is life itself for the woman. These are the opening sentences to Beauvoir's most famous essay, as mentioned, The Woman in Love, found in her most important work, The Second Sex. Just as woman enters the world of man-made values as an inferior other, so too does woman enter the world of romance, love, and life as an inferior other to man. Love is easy for men, according to Beauvoir. Love is life itself, the very embodiment of enslavement for woman. What does Beauvoir actually mean by this, however? Love was not created equal, or more appropriately, the division of love is not equal between men and women, because the norms of love and courtship were invented by men and not by women, and therefore imposed upon women by men. Love for women requires everything within them, the total devotion of soul and body in this enterprise and encounter known as love. Women, Beauvoir informs us, must abandon themselves entirely in the process of love. That is what she means when it is said that love is life itself for the woman. Women, Beauvoir says, must give themselves entirely over to man in the encounter with love and therefore subject themselves to what the man desires and what the man wants. As such, they allow themselves to become objectified by their romantic male counterparts. The essence of this essay within the second sex, and arguably the most famous within the entire book, is that love is a social construction established by men for the benefit of men at the detriment to women. While those of us who live in the 21st century have probably already now encountered this argument, it was a novel argument advanced by Simone de Beauvoir during her time in the middle of the 20th century. The entire abdication of the self in this process of love is the result of the male creation and construction of what love is. Love has a connotation of male superiority, according to Beauvoir. For instance, men are the ones who are supposed to make the first move in courtship and romance. Therefore, men are the prime movers in the enterprise of love because, if we recall from Beauvoir's introduction, which I provided a lecture on, man is the metaphysical given in the world we live in. Man is the absolute, and because man is the absolute and has created the world of love, he makes the first move, therefore positioning himself in the relationship of dominance within the relationship of love. Woman is the other defined in negative correspondence to man. This is also true, therefore, in love. Courtship and dating, for instance, are all predicated on man making the first move. Love for women is completely dependent upon men. Women need men to choose to love them for it to be considered normal. If a woman moves first, this is unwomanly or unladylike. Woman, therefore, is completely enslaved to the first moves of man in the construction of love that men have created for themselves. Beauvoir also highlights the othering of women in the endeavor of love and to be loved through language. The very idea of wanting to be loved promotes oneself as an object to a subject. 
The subject, of course, is man, and the object, of course, is woman. I want to be loved rather than to know love is the same Augustinian dilemma that St. Augustine dealt with in the Confessions and throughout his life as a Christian philosopher and theologian. And, as mentioned, Simone de Beauvoir is paradoxically and ironically deeply influenced by Augustine, even though she rejects his Christianity. But we should recognize that Augustine did embrace a form of love that did away with man and woman. For men and women subject themselves to the love of God. Rejecting God, Beauvoir is therefore unable to get out of this dilemma. We are stuck in the sexual dialectic and conflict between men and women, wrestling with each other over the world of love and what it means to love and to be loved and to know love. Therefore, Beauvoir moves beyond Augustine and argues that love in of itself as the construction of a subject-object relationship is evil. And our own language reflects this when we begin to understand it from the perspective of women. The language of love highlights the insignificance of women in the structures of love itself. First, when women think of love, they always have the image of man beside them or totally taking over their consciousness. Love cannot preserve the singularity of female consciousness. The idea of love brings in male consciousness and therefore threatens female consciousness. The image of male-centered courtship and love then impacts the language that women use within their own understanding of love. And here Beauvoir adheres to the image to linguistic philosophy of language. We are primarily image-based animals who subsequently construct language to reflect the imagery we create for ourselves. For instance, the language that my little girl or my girl or my dear, my dear child all reflect a male domination within the construct of love. We don't really hear lovers say my little boy or my dear boy, but instead we hear my little girl or my dear girl. All of it reflecting the fact, the facticity, that men are in the dominating position within the relationship of love. Women are objectified by men in the very language of love because, again reaching back to her famous introduction, women consent to the male-dominated structures that define them and define their lives, which reduce women to bare facticity. Likewise, some of our own romantic language reflects this idea that men control and dominate the reality and the structures of love. I feel so small in your arms, so often said by women or other language like, hold me, hold me, continue to perpetuate male-dominated love structures and courtship. Women consent to being objectified by men in their language and women also consent to being objectified by men in their own language when they thrust themselves onto men and speak of that language of dependent otherness. As Beauvoir claims, man, being the metaphysical given, constructed himself as a god, and the entire system of love reflects this. Woman is dependent on man, god, for her well-being and happiness, her salvation, just as it is in traditional theology. Women are not only objectified in love, they praise man, like praising God, so as to win the flattering praise of God for a job well done, so to speak. Women throw themselves upon the altar of men, hoping that man will take notice of them. Love is a system and construction of relationality in which man's consciousness and subjectivity dominates over woman's consciousness and subjectivity. In the want to be loved, women become submissive 
and subject themselves to the whims and desires of men in their moments of ecstatic rapture. Hence why it is just a mere occupation for man. Men only love in fleeting moments, whereas women constantly and always are seeking love because in the current structures of love, their nature, their essence as the beloved requires a man recognizing them. In consenting to this domination by men, women allow themselves to be controlled by their desires, their sexual needs, which fosters a culture and spirit of narcissism among men. The result, and here Beauvoir follows Jean-Paul Sartre from being a nothingness, that eroticism and the enterprise of love moves down the path of masochism, where men dominate women and happily do so, even violently, because women allow themselves to be objected and dominated by men. For if they do not allow the man to have pleasure in their sexual relationship, woman fears that she will lose her entire essence. But this, according to Beauvoir, is living in bad faith. This is woman accepting the structures and powers established by men to be ultimately nothing because a man couldn't give any care about what actually happens to woman. He can always find another. But can a woman always find another man? Since the aim of love is identification with the loved one, which perpetuates absorption or union with the one, the absolute, which is in this case the man. And since man is the one and the absolute and the constructed Godhead within the relations and structures of love, this means that women in surrendering themselves to men in love are ultimately eradicated and absorbed by man. In, revol in revolting against herself, which perpetuates narcissism and masochism for the sexual gratification of men, women become ensnared and trapped in this vicious cycle of love, which ultimately beats down and destroys her. Love, whether it is passionate or romantic, is ultimately a form of bad faith on the part of women. Again, unlike contemporary feminists, Beauvoir places the blame on women herself rather than men because woman's true nature, as she asserts in her introduction, is as a creator of values, is as a creator of the world, is as a creator of relationships. If women actually created the values, the systems, the structures, and the world to benefit them rather than submit to men and the structures and forms of love they have created, women would not be in this moment of crisis. Women who act in bad faith are the ones who perpetuate the system of male domination. Beauvoir is not really blaming the victim, so to speak, she is trying to raise feminist and female consciousness to make them recognize that they have all the power that men do. They can create their own world. They can create their own values. They can create their own relationships. They can establish a new system of love which places them as the center subject of loving activity rather than adoring man, flattering man, and sacrificing themselves upon the altar of male romance. This, of course, makes us realize that Beauvoir has an intense empathy and sympathy for the plight of women. Love, as it currently exists, is a mechanism built into the world for women to try to escape the harshness of reality. Fearing and afraid of the great call of building a new world, that terrifying call to go out and create a world for themselves is often very terrifying and horrifying. Therefore, they retreat into the construct of love, which has been built by men, because this construct of love built by men 
is a safety valve for the harshness of life in the world. Men long ago realized the harshness of life in the world and so constructed the systems that we inherited today to allow for reprieve and rest. Love was one of these constructions, which in time made men's lives easier while not doing particularly anything for women because it was, of course, first constructed by men. And Beauvoir is trying to tell women they must recognize this unfortunate, harsh, even terrifying reality that love is not what it's all cracked up to be. Thus, in her most famous essay, Beauvoir is really crystallizing what she established in her introduction. Women is othered in love by man. Man, in the construction and system that is called love, is the metaphysical given, the absolute, the God. Woman is not only othered in love, and through love by man, she is objectified by man in love. She negates herself in love. Furthermore, love itself, as a social construct, was first designed and created, as mentioned, by men for their own benefit. This is why men fight so eagerly, so creatively, and so passionately to defend the constructs and systems of love. By defending it, they are defending their own interests. Women must attack the social construct of male romance and love in order to free themselves and create their own enterprise of love which will transcend the current order and liberate men and liberate women into their new world. Women can create a new world of love, a new world of values within that love, and new relationships of love within that world they create. This is what Simone de Beauvoir is calling women to achieve, to liberate themselves from the male construction of love that they've inherited, and to create something new, something better, something liberating. Beauvoir's feminism is not the bourgeois careerism of mainstream feminism today, the so-called equal pay for equal work movement, or the idea that we need more women CEOs, business leaders, and so on. No, Beauvoir repudiates this as a type of false feminism because it locks women into the male-established capitalist economic system and reduces women into bourgeois careerists, that is, they become and act essentially like men. Rather, Beauvoir's feminism is what some have called true feminism. It is about recognizing the inherent differences in the power relations between man and woman and what a woman's response should be, the destruction of the male-created systems that they are currently enslaved by and inhabiting, and creating a new world, a new system, and new relationships out of it. Woman needs to be able, again, to choose freely, independent of all male constructs. They need to be able to create ex nihilo, independent of all male influence, and they need to find their own meaning, independent of men. That is the call for the woman in love. This is what men, of course, fear to lose, their monopoly on power and structural control and creation. This is precisely what women need to understand, their ability to create and control for themselves, free of any and all male influence, is what Beauvoir is ultimately calling all women to achieve. So as it currently exists, women cannot actually love, because if women love, they are falling into the trap, into the social construction established by men. The difference in male and female relations, according to Beauvoir, is where the power of creativity resides. So long as it resides in men, it comes to the detriment of females. And this is true, most tragically, 
and our relations of love.